Uh, today's reading is from Jeremiah. Uh, so we'll be reading from Jeremiah chapter 26 and verses 8 to 13. Got it right? But as soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people everything the Lord had commanded him to say, the priests, the prophets, and all the people seized him and said, you must die. Why do you prophesy in the Lord's name that this house will be like Shiloh and this city would be desolate and deserted? And all the people crowded around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard about these things, they went up from the royal palace to the house of the Lord and took their places at the entrance of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and all the people, this man should be sentenced to death because he has prophesied against this city. You have heard it with your own ears. Then Jeremiah said to all the officials and all the people, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the things you have heard. Now, reform your ways and your actions and obey the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and not bring the disaster he has pronounced against you. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Um, and now Martin is going to bring us God's word. So if you'd like to reach out and we'll just pray for Martin. Dear Heavenly Father, bless Martin and enrich his thinking as he brings us your word. Amen. Amen. Welcome, church. If you are visiting or here for the first time, you are very welcome to be with us. Um, my name is Martin. I'm one of... If you're in Anglican speak, I'm in a reader. If you're not, I'm a licensed lay minister. And we're much the same thing. So I'm one of the people who works here along with the clergy. And if you didn't know, and you're here for the first time, this is the first week without our senior minister, who's now gone off to do new exciting things. What I'd like us to do, actually, it struck me as we were praying, that perhaps we could just pray for Paul in his new role, um, since this is the first Sunday since we have him. So let's have a quick word of prayer for Paul and the family as they've moved off. Lord, we pray for Paul and, and Lou and the family as Paul uh, went off to a new role. Lord, we pray that you'll be with him from this day forward, from this first Sunday. Bless him and bless those who he's serving. Lord, fill him with your spirit as before, but more and more. And Lord, be with us as we move forward to find someone who can lead us as well. Just bless us and keep us through this time of vacancy. For thy dear name's sake. Amen. Amen. I rather hope he's got a slightly easier preaching session than I have. Because um, he left me with the topic, and we're still doing Jeremiah, but it's harvest. Now, we'll get both of those in, hopefully, as you will see as we go forward, um, both Jeremiah and harvest. And um, you're saying, oh, it's Jeremiah again. We're well, going to say that next week, because it's still Jeremiah again next week. Um, I was chatting to somebody earlier on who, who gave me a, quite an interesting story. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but I do appreciate the story, and I'm going to use it, if that's okay. Well, if, well if you, even if you forgot this, it won't necessarily come as something you've heard before. Um, that uh, there was an American preacher who had been preaching, and he preached the same sermon week after week after week after week, and eventually the elders got together and said, this has got to stop. We can't go on with you preaching the same sermon every single week. And he said, well, I'm going to keep preaching it until the people do what I'm preaching. And I think Jeremiah's a bit like that. You know, we need to keep reminding ourselves what Jeremiah's saying here and, and make sure that we don't have to be preached the same thing every week until we do what God is saying. But well, that's sort of the problem that the, the, uh, the Hebrews had that they had been told time and time and time again that they were going the wrong way. And we're going to look at that in a minute as we go through Jeremiah. But I just would like to try and put this in context today. It just strikes me that we are bombarded with news about evil and horrible things that have been going on where apparently nobody said anything. 
I'm sure you don't need me to spell it out, but I will. You know, we're still in the middle of all this stuff coming out about Harrods. We're not long from the post office scandal where people must have known what was going on, but they didn't say anything. And they didn't say anything to stop it. And it struck me as to, first of all, to look at what is it that stops people, you, me, everybody, from calling out evil? What stops us from calling out people from doing wrong things? Is it fear of repercussions? Is it fear that, uh, in some cases, people have said they were threatened with violence? Perhaps they would be threatened with the loss of their job, and in some paper cases, people did lose their job, and even were threatened with getting difficulty in getting jobs in the future. Um, fear of loss of income, fear of people uh, and people in power. Maybe it's complacency. You've heard people say, oh, well, it's always like that. He's like that. That's what it's like. Put up with it. Nothing to do with me. Keep your head down. And the other end, I think, is complicity. They knew it was going wrong, but they benefited from that because they supported whatever the problem was, whatever the fault was, whoever was causing that. They were preferred for promotion. Um, somehow or other, they might even felt it was some sort of bribery to keep quiet, love of money. So in that sense, from Jeremiah's time, nothing much has changed. I'm trying to think back through my career. When have I gone out on a limb and challenged wrongdoing? I've been fortunate in a sense of working for companies that didn't do much, which I thought was particularly wrong. But I can think of a few occasions where I might have said more than I should have done and probably led to me made, being made redundant at least twice in my career. Um, not necessarily directly, but I have a suspicion in a couple of cases indirectly. But I can also think of circumstances where perhaps I should have said more, where I said, oh, I'm down the middle really, well, it's just like that. You know, that's how people are. And I've looked back and thought, should I have done better? And I'm sure we can all think of those circumstances. The good thing about God is if we bring those to him and say, Lord, I should have done better, can you show me how to do better in the future? Then he will put those things aside and just lead us into doing good things. But Jeremiah was tasked with passing on God's message. If we go back to the bit slightly before the bit we read today, because it's important, in 26 verse 2, God says, Tell them everything I command you. Do not omit do not omit a word. This is the story. This is the message you have to give out. There is no other message. You can't change it. You can't water it down. Even if you think it's going to be unpopular, this is the message you have to give. And God goes on to say, Perhaps they will listen and each will turn in his evil ways. Then I will relent and I will not inflict upon them the disaster I was planning before the evil they have done. So he was to do this he might have been fearful, but he was to do it essentially without fear, even at the highest level. It came close to costing him his life. He was put in prison, Jeremiah. He was uh, actually saved from the brink by the very person he'd been criticizing, but he was close to, to dying. As I was listening to the reading, <coughs> the, uh, eld the elders of the church, the, uh, the leaders, the priests, went and stood outside the temple and said, this man must die because of what he's saying. And I thought, that's exactly what they said about Jesus. If you look at the Gospels, those words, almost the same words, were used, certainly the same intent. This man saying stuff, which, as far as the Pharisees were concerned, had two problems. One is it, it criticized them. Secondly, it, it threatened the position with Rome. And their solution was this man must die. Well, of course, in Jesus' case, that's exactly what happened. Even so, no one listened. God's anger was, was with the people of Judah. They turned away from worshipping the Father. If you haven't been listening for the last few weeks, they turned mostly to worshipping Baal. Baal is the name for a variety of gods around there. Um, clearly not real gods. I mean, there's something about humankind that likes making this image and then pretending it's a god and worshipping it. I personally can't understand why. As a Christian, I suppose you wouldn't expect me to. But that seems to be a trend. We like to worship something, and if we've made it, it's even better. Weird. But there you go, and they were doing this. And the problem, additional problem of worshipping Baal was it was very 
sexually um, uh, infused. There's a lot of things like um, prostitution going on and even sacrifice of children. You can imagine why the Father, God the Father, was incensed with his chosen people that they had gone down this route. <clears throat> and it's not as if it's the first time that they've been told. I said before about this preaching the same sermon umpteen times. If you go back to Isaiah, who was about a hundred years earlier, uh, we get almost exactly the same story. That although they went through the prescribed rituals, the people's behavior was so bad that God found their sacrifices and prayers loathsome. Their religiosity, religiosity, I can't say that, religiosity did not cover their sin. By the time they got to Jeremiah a hundred years later, they'd gone even further in turning away from God. But telling truth to power is always difficult. It can be career-threatening. It can be life-threatening. To say in my example, yes, I've been made redundant twice, but God looked after me. We can't rely upon being better off because we've done something, but we need to rely on God to help us to speak truth to power. We have Isaiah's example. We have Jeremiah's example. And in the Gospels, we have Jesus' example. Jesus criticized the religious authorities on many occasions for their love of self, of power, and of position. And particularly, as we come to thinking about harvest, their lack of care for the ordinary people. He said, you're stopping the ordinary people going to heaven, and you're not even going there yourself. Actually, he didn't like this very much, but um, he spoke out, not changing one word. So, how do we go forward? I was all, when I was learning, to, going through preaching, uh, one of my ministers said, you've got to have a so what at the end. Are we going to have one in the middle here? Um, so what? Okay, how does that apply to us? Are our voices being heard out there proclaiming God's word? Not sure if I've used this, this thought here, but if being a Christian was made a crime, could they find enough evidence against you to take you to court? If all we ever do is, is talk amongst ourselves, which is great, and we have fellowship amongst ourselves, we are not reaching the people outside. We need to be in the world, not of it, but we need to be in the world so that we can speak to others and other people get to hear the gospel through us. I think Paul said, I think it was last week, wearing a sandwich board and shouting the end is nigh from the end of the uh, North Street is, is not necessarily the best way to reach people. Many years ago, we did a video course on how to reach out to other people. It's called Walking Across the Room. If you ever find it, watch it. One of the examples of how not to do it was some lady at the bottom of some stairs, there's a plumber upstairs and top of the ladder in a, in a loft, to which she, she proclaims to him, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Which probably meant not a loss to this particular person. So we have to work out how we are going to preach the gospel, how we are going to spread the word, get people back from what they're doing. It has to be digestible. It has to be relevant. I challenged before, and I hope you've thought about what, your, what the Americans call your elevator talk is, which means can you preach the gospel between floors one and three in a lift? It's got to be that short. You might only get that short time. Somebody might say to you, well, what, why do you go to church on Sunday? What's the answer? It's warm and cosy. I get to meet my friends because that's where we meet with the living God. However, that's what you want to be, feel comfortable to say. That might be the only bit you get, but it's a start. And we need to be unshaken by opposition, ridicule, possibly even the cost of action. Perhaps, people, perhaps we won't be preferred at work because people know we're a Christian. The challenge is that's tough, but that's what we have to do. Jesus doesn't call us to an easy life in this world, but to great blessing in the next. And he didn't look for an easy life. He just kept on, and Jeremiah just kept on, and it made his life very difficult. In fact, it nearly ended it. So where's the harvest in all this, you are asking? I'm sure you are. Point where I got this point, I thought, where's the harvest in this? So I thought, we've got to get some harvest in this because we've got some marvelous stuff here that people have bought. 
And as Ari was saying, um, Ari was saying, it, most of us don't actually do much harvesting. Can I, anybody here not, uh, yes, not eaten anything they've actually grown this year? Anybody only eaten stuff they've bought? Anybody, we put it the other way around, who's eaten stuff they've grown? Good. Well, our contribution to eating stuff we've grown was a pot about this big with lettuces in it, um, which we don't normally do. It's the first time in years we've grown anything. We used to have a bit of a garden we grew things in. And um, we only grew that because Penny, my wife, found a five-year-old packet of lettuce seeds and thought, well, I, I could throw it away, but let's see if anything comes up. And sure enough, we know we had lettuces the rest of the season. We were just pulled up. Um, by the way, if you want to show uh, anybody and you want to find out how lettuces are grown or any of these sort of fruits, one of the blessings of COVID, we discovered all the footpaths behind our house. And there's an enormous set of fields there where probably a lot of the lettuces that you've harvested at your local supermarket were grown. And you get to see them from little pellets that come in on a lorry so the factory machine it gets dragged across. Go and have a look. It's absolutely fascinating to see how your products are produced. But most of us don't go out there and harvest. You used to be able to say most of us do our harvesting down at the supermarket. I suspect a lot of us have our harvest brought to us in a van these days. We certainly do. Occasionally we go harvesting in the supermarket, but not often. So what, what harvest does the Lord want us to bring if we're not actually physically out there doing it? Now I'd like to take you back to Isaiah. I said Isaiah was some hundred years before Jeremiah. And he starts off pretty tough. As they say, buckle up because this is tough stuff. I'll read you a bit of Isaiah because I think it's relevant to us all. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Your incense is detestable, new moon, Sabbath and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you even when you offer many prayers. I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. I couldn't find out who it was, but I remember a South American bishop when asked at one of the Anglican convocations in the UK how he operated his church, he said, all week we're out in the community helping those in need and living out the gospel of the good news. I'll read that again. All week we're out in the community helping those in need and living out the gospel of the good news. On Sundays we come together to pray and praise God. That was the order. The church was out there doing God's work being Jesus' eyes, hands, ears, and mouth. And on Sundays, they came together to worship. Not, it wasn't all about getting nice, slick services and building new churches and so on. Churches in the sense of buildings. It was about doing Jesus' work here on order, on earth. So the sacrifice that God wants us is not slick church services and rituals, but a servant community, being God's hand, Jesus' hands, ears, eyes, and mouth in the world. Not fearing to be his mouth, not to changing his word. One bishop I did actually manage to find who it was that did it was Bishop Oscar Romero. Some of you may have heard of Bishop Oscar Romero. He said the following, a church that suffers no persecution but enjoys the privileges and supports the things of the earth, beware, it is not the true church of Jesus Christ. A preaching that does not point out sin is not the preaching of the gospel. A preaching that makes sinners feel good so that they are secure in their sinful state betrays the gospel's call. Oscar Romero was bishop, Archbishop of San Salvador 
According to the BBC, he spoke out against the US finance security forces became too much of a threat to the government. In 1980, he was shot dead while celebrating mass. His last words were, may God have mercy on my assassin. It's tough. It's tough calling out evil. But we are called to do that. That's the thing we do. If we want to follow Jesus' example, we need to call out evil. We need to do it in a way which is loving, not aggressive, not hateful, but intended to bring people to their senses. We need to do it without fear or favor. We are certainly uh, not expected to uh, be complacent and assume if it will be all right and somebody else will do it. We are called to do that. It's not easy, but Jesus never said it would be. So what we brought here today, Harvest, is great. I'm glad it's at the front here. Hopefully most of you can see it. Because this is going to the food bank. This is not for the rich and powerful. It's not for ourselves. But it's for those on the margins. That's one of the things of the church we are called to do. Which both Isaiah and Jeremiah said the church wasn't doing and needed to do. Not look after itself, but to look after those who are in need. Isaiah refers to that group of people as the oppressed, the fatherless, and the widows. So let's strive to do this, not just on Harvest Sunday. It's great we bought this, but if we could bring that every week, that would be really good between us, if not more. And to find ways in which we can serve those who really need our help, really need our support, and be a, a, a salt in the, in the world for Jesus. So the harvest that God wants us is not slick services and rituals, but a servant community, being Jesus' hands, his eyes, and his ears in the world, and not fearing to be his mouthpiece as well. Let's pray. Lord, you have called us to a hard and difficult uh, mission for you to speak out about against evil whenever we find it. Lord, to do it in, in love for those around us that we, they might be called back from their evil ways. Lord, even small things which we see as being wrong would help us to, to act against them, to find help for those who need help, protect the poor and the needy. Lord, help us to do it without fear of what mankind can throw at us. But Lord, to rest in your love and know that you will be with us, beside us throughout it all. For thy dear name's sake. Amen.